ANA eLearning Academy is brought to you by CDN Graysheet, a trusted source of rare coin and currency valuations since 1963. Everyone, thank you for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. Today we have Rod Gillis presenting on Grading 101. You will be muted during this presentation, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat in the Q&A, and we will stop periodically throughout the presentation to answer those questions. Um, and without further ado, here's Rod. Well, thank you, Logan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rod Gillis, and I'm the Education Director at the American Numismatic Association. And uh, I'm here today to talk with you about uh, the fundamentals of grading. And basically what I've done is I've taken and compiled notes from uh, the live grading class that uh, I teach during su the summer seminar with Mike Ellis and Brian Fanton. Now, as you can imagine, you know, um, we actually use coins and, and the, the live class, uh, we can go through um, the, the grading pretty deeply. Uh, and we really can't do that here. I mean, the, the, with the, uh, the eLearning Academy, the one class that is a little tough for us is grading because it's best to have the coins in front of you. And even if I had the coins with me, showing them to you, uh, by camera really doesn't do the coins justice. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the theories behind grading. And then um, I'm going to open up the, uh, I'm going to stop the class, open it up a little bit um, after every so often and stop and then see if you have any questions and we'll take five or 10 minutes if you do. And we'll answer those before we move forward. So hopefully you'll be able to get something out of this class. And um, uh, I appreciate you taking uh, part of your busy time to be able to spend it with me. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started. So basically what we're going to do today is we're going to define grading. We're gonna tell you what it is. Um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the evolution of coin grading, the history behind it. Um, we'll spend some time talking about uh, uh, slabbing coins, uh, third-party grading companies, numismatic certifications. Um, we'll um, talk about how to examine a coin. Uh, we'll take a look at initial points of wear uh, as well as focal points. So uh, that's what we have planned for you. And we're going to start off today by talking about grading myths, okay? Um, the very first grading myth, grades never change. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's just not true. Gradings, uh, grades change all the time. Uh, sometimes probably for very good reasons, others perhaps not. Um, but uh, coins, uh, the grades are refined and um, I'll be able to show you specific examples of how grades change over time. So we'll be able to take a look at that. Number two. Only professionals can grade coins. Well, if that were the case, there'd be no purpose for having this class, uh, spending our time together. Uh, my personal belief is that everyone uh, that, is, that is out there, that is with me today, and everyone who has a collection of some sort has the necessary talent to be able to grade at least their own coins. And, you know, that's an important advantage because when you go to a coin show not all coins have been slabbed and so that means that if there's a coin that is of particular interest to you and uh, you want to take a close look at it you should be able to know what it is that you're looking for to give you an approximate idea of the grade that you're dealing with and that's so important because the grade often relates to the price so you don't want to spend more than you have to for a particularly uh, graded coin. And so that's why it's important. I know that I can share with you that we've often taught the grading class right before a coin show. And uh, one of the um, uh, one of the highest, uh, I guess, the, the uh, commendations that I have is when somebody comes up to me who took my class 
and says, you know, Rod, I, I, I want to show you the coin that I bought, and this is what I paid for it. And uh, I never would have had the courage to buy this coin because I would have been too afraid that I would have gotten taken. And, and you know, 99% of the time, the person has bought a coin and it's exactly what they perceived it to be. And so we've been able to help them that way. And hopefully we can help you. Uh, a grade is either right or wrong. Well, grading is subjective. And because grading is subjective, that means that uh, there are gray areas. And so to say a grade is either right or wrong is, uh, is, is tough to prove. If you have two um, graders and they're off by a point, you know, chances are that's pretty good. Now, if I look at a coin and I grade it as being in good condition, and uh, the someone else grades it as being in almost uncirculated, one of us is wrong and one of us has a problem um, with grading. But when you're very close, that's good enough. And I know that some of you may be thinking, yeah, Rod, well, you know, the grade between a 65 and a 66 1893S Morgan dollar is huge. And, and you're right. Uh, I can't deny that. But just in terms of everyday grading, um, I, I think it's safe to say that if you're within a point of someone, you're, you're, you're in good stead. Okay. Uh, and, and that leads us to the next one. Professional graders always agree. Because grading is subjective, that means that they can't always agree. And here's the other dirty little secret is that professional graders are human beings and therefore they make mistakes. So, you know, there are times when you might run across a coin that has been graded and you might be saying to yourself, I just don't see that at all. I don't understand how they got there. And because they're human beings and because they make mistakes, uh, in that instance, you may be correct. So it's important to understand that. And the final thing is, if the coin is in a mint state holder, it cannot have any wear. And you might be thinking, well, how is that possible? Because mint state means it is supposed to be uncirculated and not show anywhere at all. And you are correct if that's what you're thinking. Um, but when we're talking about real expensive coins, um, the uh, third party grading companies often give a little leeway, especially with gold. And um, if it's a very valuable gold coin, they may see a little wear, a little rub, but they're going to let it go. And the reason is because they are not using technical grading, they're using market grading. And we're going to be spending time uh, in a few minutes discussing what technical grading and what market grading is and talking about the difference between the two. The standard philosophy is that grading is an art and not a science. And, and I would say that that is true. There are some people who just naturally gravitate to grading and are just very good at it. Uh, there are some folks who uh, have to struggle and have to work very hard to attain a, a certain level in grading. Um, I, uh, and and uh, I've noticed that you know um, there are a lot of youngsters who I've worked with um, who just naturally do very well in grading. And uh, those uh, youngsters are often employed at third-party grading companies. Uh, so uh, it, it definitely is an art. And that means that some of us have an easier time with it than others. I, have, I, would, uh, I would say that grading is more art than science. Um, so it, it definitely is subjective. And uh, that is, uh, that's an important, uh, it's an important lesson to learn. Let's talk about how grading is defined. Really grading is a shorthand communication. It's a language all of its own. It describes a coin in sufficient detail, describes its state or preservation. Um, it's a standard common language, hasn't always been that way. And it also establishes a value range for sight unseen trades. It provides an alternate to the previous ways that people sent communications about coins before photography, and that was drawings and pressings. Later on, when photography was developed, that was a big help 
for coins. But again, as we've discussed, uh, it's it's very difficult to be able to grade a coin by a photo. Uh, I much rather have a coin in hand. One of the big reasons for that is it's virtually impossible by use of a photo to be able to determine the amount of um, uh, luster on a coin. And so uh, when you're looking at a mint state coin or even a coin that is AU, the luster is extremely important. And really the best way to be able to determine luster is by looking at the coin in your hand. So here's a photo of a uh, 1870 Carson City half dollar. What I want you to do is I want you to take a moment and look at this coin carefully, both obverse and reverse. And I want you to think for a moment, if you had to describe this coin to a potential buyer, let's say this coin was yours and you were interested in selling it, and you wanted to describe this coin to a potential buyer, and for whatever reason, uh, the buyer is uh, not able to view the coin, it's sight unseen. So take just a moment, study the coin carefully, and think about what it is that you would want to say in describing this coin. Well, if I were uh, describing the coin, you might say something like this. An example that has been lightly circulated with a touch of wear on the coin's high points. The piece has a moderate amount of scattered marks throughout the fields on both obverse and rever reverse. A few minor rim bumps are visible upon close examination. Liberty is bold and complete on the shield. The centers of the stars are visible. The detail of Liberty's gown is nearly complete. The eagle's shield and feathers are complete with just a minor amount of wear along the neck and wingtips. The talons are nearly complete with just a small amount of wear. The coin has a modest amount of luster remaining accented with blue highlights. Now, that's very descriptive. Some of us might say that it's too descriptive because how can you take all of that information in and visualize what the coin is? And I would say that you're right. How could you do that? That would be very difficult. So grading, a standardized form of grading was designed so that we can convey all of this information. And if we did it today, we would simply say it's an AU58. We might say it's an AU58 with a slight amount of toning, but if we tell someone that this coin is an AU58, they should automatically know, based on the ANA grading standards, um, approximately what the coin looks like, All right? So um, there are initially when grading, the idea of grading was undertaken uh, and trying to standardize grading, <coughs> pardon me, there was uh, some confusion, as you can well imagine. And there were terms that were brought up like a tad circulated. Well, you know, the operative word there is tad. What, what does that mean? Good for the piece. Does that mean that the other, the rest of the coins that are just like that coin is, is not... Uh, it's not attractive. What does that mean? My favorite and, and is this one. Was a proof now uncirculated? Now, um, there are a few things that I really want you to get from this PowerPoint presentation, and this is one of them. That sentence, was a proof now uncirculated, can't be. All right? And here's why. The term proof is not a grade. The term proof describes a method of manufacturing, describes how a specially polished dyes are used to uh, strike a highly polished planchet. 
uh, probably twice, if not more times, to produce a highly reflective mirror-like surface on the coin. So because it describes a method of manufacturing, you could take a coin, a proof coin, and you could put it out in the middle of the street and you could have a truck run over it 10 times and it's still a proof coin. At that point, the term for it would be an impaired proof, okay? Uh, but it's still a proof. Once a proof coin is created, it's always a proof for its entire lifetime. That It can never be taken away. So the idea that a coin was a proof, but now is uncirculated, can't be because what they're saying there is that a proof coin uh, can, cannot be anything other than uncirculated. And that's just not true. As, as I've mentioned to you, a proof coin can be circulated and show signs of wear, and it still is a proof coin, all right? That's a, that's a really important concept. And if you understand that and keep that bit of knowledge, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. You're gonna know more than some dealers know about that. Uh, sight unseen purchases were very risky. Collectors learned multiple language. There was no standardized grading language. And collectors had to learn how individual dealers graded their coins. You know, and dealers are not the only one. People who own coins, we have a tendency to inflate the grade of our coins, especially when we're trying to sell them, and deflate the grades of coins that we are interested in buying. Early attempts to standardize uh, the grading system. The, the first call for standards for United States coins was in 1892. In the February issue of the Numismatist, uh, Joseph Hooper wrote a piece, and he described uh, proof and uncirculated only, okay, for being mint state coins. Uh, he also mentioned the terms extremely fine, very fine, fine, very good, good, very fair, fair, poor, and very poor. And so according to Joseph, these are the terms that he was hoping that uh, people all over the country would draft. And by using these, these terms, people would have a very good idea of what a coin looked like and certainly the amount of wear that was present on the coin. The New York Times wrote an article in 1904 called, What Gives Old Coins Value? And in the article, they say the principal reason for a large premium on a coin is its scarcity, which is true, vintage number. The next thing in importance to the issue of a coin is its condition. And upon this really rests the value of a coin. 1907, at the ANA Columbus Convention, uh, standards were proposed by Howland Wood. And what uh, Mr. Wood uh, suggested was that we should have an uncirculated grade, a very fine, fine, very good, good, fair, and poor. And he published this in the ANA yearbook uh, that was created in 1910. And then Alfred Reschke came up with an idea of um, using a number system of percentile ranking. And he came up with the idea that uncirculated, you should give between 96 and 100 points, excellent 91, 95, superior 86 and 90. And you can see on your own as you work your way down. I, I don't know why, uh, I suppose I should, but I don't, to be honest. I don't know why he started off at 66, uh, but that's what he started off for a, a coin that was very poor. Great inflation. You know, we think of great inflation as a fairly new problem, but uh, great inflation has been around for a very long time. And uh, Otto Odehan suggested that there are writ written descriptions and variables that are always changing. Uh, a, a series of actual coins in various grades should be graded by a central authority. And he said, what used to be fine is now very fine. And uh, especially with very valuable coins uh, or coins that have a rich history, that's still correct today. Um, I've seen coins that have started off 
uh, very valuable coins that have been initially graded as extra fine and today they are mint state. And I personally can't get around that because if a coin has been graded uh, as uh, an extra fine, that means that there's a significant wear. It's still an excellent looking coin, a uh, beautiful coin, but there's obvious wear there. And how it can morph over into a mint state coin, I just don't see that. But I, I, that's in my own mind. I have seen it uh, many times. And if you come to the museum uh, here in Colorado Springs, I can show you examples of coins that I'm fully aware of that started off in extra fine condition and are now mint state. There was a uh, guide to the grading of United States coins published in 1958. And it was, uh, it's now called the Brown and Dunn. When we use the terms Brown and Dunn, we're referring to this book. It was the first standard work on grading all United States coins. It was all written descriptions. There were no um, drawings. However, it was revised in 19, 1961. And um, there were drawings that were used, uh, eventually photos for each type, uh, just identify the coins. There were no photos for the particular grades. Line drawings that, again, show the difference in grades were added uh, by 1964. The fifth edition in 1969 included an early attempt at degrees within a grade and coding a coin's attributes. And this is what they came up with. So for example, you could have a 1911 Liberty Nickel and it would be graded FC 14179R4. Can you imagine? Can you imagine uh, having a conversation with someone and using that grade? What that grade means is that a coin was in fine condition F but with the obverse a normal fine and the reverse a bit more worn, C, with a normal patina, 14, several die cracks, 17, and a rim nick, 9, on the reverse, R, at 4 o'clock. So obviously you can tell that even though that's a, it's a nice attempt that something like this could not be practical. We could not have conversations using a code like that and people being having the ability to understand. And then James Ruddy came out with a landmark book, Photograde, a Photographic Grading Guide for United States Coins, published in 1970. And he uses photographs of coins for each grade uh, and includes a brief written description. Uh, no images or description of mid-state coins, though, like in Brown and Dunn. This was the widely accepted standard for circulated coins for a very, very long time. And then... Ken Brissett and Abe Kossoff uh, in 1977 published the ANA Standard Guide to Grading. Uh, and uh, they introduced standards for mint state coins, really for the first time. And they basically had three grades, typical, choice, and perfect. There are specific written descriptions for both the obverse and reverse. They at that time resurrected the line drawings. Uh, actual photographs appeared in 1987 with the third edition, edition, and color photographs appear in the seventh, which is the latest edition. Something I learned that was very interesting um, is that Kember said, while he was very influential in uh, helping to publish the ANA grading standards and establish the ANA grading standards, he actually worked with Brown and Dunn with that initial book that we discussed. Um, Ken has been in the hobby for a very long time and he's been involved in, in a great deal of many things. And so I just found it interesting that he was involved with Brown and Dunn and worked all the way up to publishing the uh, ANA grading standards uh, in 1977. That's pretty amazing. And then there are third party grading standards. And, and, and this is a real important concept that I wanna spend a couple minutes with. <clears throat> the Professional Coin Grading Service, otherwise known as PCGS, uh, published in 1997 and revised in 2004, their grading standards. Um, New uh, NGC, Numismatic Guarantee Corporation, 
published their standards in 2004. Uh, they put it, placed a focus on modern coins post-1964 and included a guide for grading uncirculated and proof coins. Now, here's a, here's a real important concept. Um, we probably know that uh, PCGS and NGC are considered the first tier of third-party grading companies. There are other third-party grading companies, and, and I'm not trying to suggest that those that are in the second and third tier are any less accurate. Um, I'm just telling you that for whatever reason, the uh, dealers recognize PCGS and NGC uh, third-party grading companies as the primary source. There are others uh, that we could probably put in a second tier, ICG, ANAX. And again, I'm, I'm not here to debate whether ICG or ANAX are any less than PCGS or NGC, but it would be dishonest of me to say that PCGS and NGC are, are not recognized um, by dealers more readily than any other company. So some of you might be thinking, well, I've heard of someone who had a coin that was graded by one of these major third-party grading companies, and then for, they weren't happy with the grade, and they sent it out to uh, the other company, and they came back with a completely different grade. How can that happen? That's a great question. And the answer is, is because each of these third-party grading companies have uh, a different set of standards. So if you send a coin to PCGS, they're going to use their established PCGS standards. Same thing with NGC. If you're, you're sending a coin to NGC, they're going to use their standards. And so if you're running across a particular coin where their standards are different, chances are you're going to get a different grade. Now, it's fair to say that all of the third-party grading companies got their initial start by using the ANA grading standards. And then over time, they morphed into the grading standards that they were more comfortable using because that's their company that they certainly have the right to do that. Uh, but if you've ever wondered why you got a coin that came back with two different grades after sending it to two different companies, that's the reason. It's because they have different standards of grading. And it would be safe to say that there are uh, some coins, PCGS are known for grading more conservatively. And there are some coins that NGC are noted for grading more conservatively. And so that can work two ways. If you wanted a coin and you wanted to grade highly, you know, at, at, at a high grade, um, you might be tempted to send it to one of the companies that aren't known for grading that coin as conservatively as the other. But if you have a coin that you believe is just an outstanding coin and it will still receive a high grade, even if it's sent to the company that is known for grading it conservatively and it comes back with a high grade, now you've got really something outstanding. So it can work both ways. There are strategies as to which company you wanna send it to, okay? Uh, dealers often play that game, and I just want to make you aware of that. Uh, and then the, we came out with the Sheldon system. And the Sheldon system started out with large cents uh, in 1949. And uh, Mr. Sheldon, he decided that he was going to link a, the coin's value to its condition. Uh, which was the very first uh, attempt at doing that. And he decided that he was going to do that by uh, using numbers. So what he did is he took a, uh, uh, he tracked the sales of common varieties of 1794 cents. And um, then he came up with a mathematical equation. And he said that uh, a coin in its basal state, which means it's, it's, very low estate where you can still identify with, with the coin, with what the coin is at that time, sold for 50 cents, between 50 cents and $1.50. Uh, the same 1794 cent in what he used as fair condition, 
slightly better than condition number one was given the number two because it bring it brought twice as much as the basal state of one. So he's saying that fair coins sell for about two dollars. So if you use that, that means good uh, would be about twice a fair and, uh, and so on. Uh, fine would be three times as much as good. And that's how he came up with this equation that connected the number system to the value. And the equation is cent value equals basal value time condition. Okay, that's, that's what he came up with. And so, a <coughs> pardon me. <clears throat> a form of that number system invented by Sheldon is still used today. So, um, and the ANA grading uh, standards adopted that. So they said a coin that is AG about good um, should be given the number three, a coin that is four uh, is good, very good is eight, and, and so on. Notice a couple of things that um, when we got to about uncirculated, you see two grades, 50 and 55. There are four AU grades today. And with mint state, the possibilities at that time were mint state 60, mint state 65, and mint state 70, only three. In 1981, with the second edition, they expanded the mint state grades. They included MS 63, and they included MS67. And then uh, in the 1987, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 1987 edition, they also included um, about uncirculated AU58. And at that time, they uh, included the mint state grades that we have today, which is mint state 60 all the way up to mint state 70. And that is a total of 11 mint state grades. So they, they started out with three and they expanded to 11. And they also discussed in uh, the ANA grading standards, the relationship between market value and grade. So what do we have today? So today we look at mint state from being MS60 through MS70. We actually have four AU grades, 50, 53, 55, and 58. Two, uh, two XFs, um, four very fines, two fines, two very goods, two goods, about good, a fair, and a poor. And that's the established uh, grading system that we use today. So people ask me all the time. So if we're looking at a fine coin, and if it's better than an F12, but it's not uh, uh, what you might consider an F15. Is there a grade F13? And the answer is technically yes, but no one ever uses the grade of 13. So it would be folly to do that. Um, you just have to make a decision as to whether it's a good example of a fine 12 or a perhaps not so good example of a fine 15. And uh, my good friend, Bill Fiva wrote a wonderful article called uh, There's Good in Every Grade, where he divides each grade up into three categories amongst itself. Uh, a coin that just makes a particular grade, just makes it. A coin that sort of is the poster child of what that particular grade looks like. And a coin that is a very good example of that particular grade. You're almost tempted to move it up to the next highest level, but just not quite. And so that's what he says. He says between each grade that you're looking at now on your screen, that there are three examples for each of those three, for each of those grades. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about before we uh, stop for a few moments is that there are two really uh, prevalent types of grading. There's technical grading and there's market grading, okay? When we talk about technical grading, we're talking about uh, the uh, recognizing the type of wear on a coin. So you're looking at a coin and, you know, um, the I in Liberty is rubbed out. So it becomes this grade. Uh, that's what technical grading is all about. And technical grading is pretty much, uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to learn. Uh, the, the standards are easy to understand. Uh, and comprehend. 
And so technical grading is, is, is pretty easy. Um, many people abandon technical grading when you get to the mint state coins. At market grading, market grading means that you're grading the coin based on an established market value. So you're looking at a coin <clears throat> and you're saying, well, I've seen a coin very similar to this and it's sold for this amount of money and it was graded MS64. So I believe that this coin is very similar to the MS64 that brought this amount of money. And therefore we're gonna grade this coin as an MS64. Um, market grading is much more prevalent with AU coins and mint state coins. Uh, market grading, it really isn't used for coins that are uh, significantly circulated. Technical grading is used for that. And like I said, technical grading is very rarely used when we're talking about uh, AU and, and mint state coins. Um, what type of grading does the third-party grading companies use? Well, they use market grading, okay? Um, most of the time, because most of the coins that are sent to them are sent in at mint state. Um, and while they do receive uh, coins that are uh, circulated, I would say that a, a great deal of those circulated coins are also very valuable coins. Okay. Uh, so the third party grading companies would use market grading. Bill Fiva likes to tell you that, uh, and I've heard him say this many times, that uh, the grading companies do not really grade a coin that they value it. Now, the grading companies might disagree with that. And they say, no, we actually do grade the coin. Uh, and I'm not here to say that grading companies are not good, honest people. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, there's certainly a, a good reason for third-party grading companies, but it's no secret that if you talk to people like Bill Fiva, he's going to say that market grading really is a way of valuing a coin, not particularly grading it, okay? So we're gonna stop here for a minute, uh, a couple minutes. And if anyone has any particular questions on what we have gone over so far, we'll stop here and I'll do my very best to answer them. So if you could send them in to Logan um, and Logan will read them to me, we'll see what we can say. All right, we have a couple so far. Um, how important is the presence of luster for a coin to achieve an AU grade? Boy, that's a that's a really great question. And I'm not going to answer that, not because I don't want to, because it's such an important concept. I'm not going to answer that because we're going to spend uh, in, in just a few minutes some very significant, uh, I'm going to share with you some very significant information on luster, and I think I'll be able to do a better job of answering that question in a few minutes. So please don't um, get upset. I promise you that uh, we should be able to answer that question, um, but I have some things that I want you to see and understand while we are tackling that. Okay, and the next one, <clears throat> more of a comment, I guess, but I think maybe you can help clear it up. Mm -hmm. What confuses me is when people say that a coin is uncirculated proof. Yeah, so let me tell you a real quick story and see if I can bring that home for you. So um, many years ago, my son was a teenager and we, my son and I happened to be uh, purchasing a pizza. And we went into the store and we placed our order and I purchased the pizza and um, uh, I got my change and we stood outside in the parking lot, just sort of hanging around waiting for the pizza to be made. And um, I was feeling my hands were in my pockets and I was feeling the coins as I just, that's a habit of mine, just as I do. And I noticed that one of the quarters that the reeded edge was extremely sharp. Uh, and without looking at the coin, I said to my son, I said, uh, this is a proof quarter. And he said to me, uh, how do you know that? I said, I can just tell it's a proof quarter. He said, no, you, you, haven't, you, you haven't looked at it yet. You can't tell. And I pulled it out of my pocket and it was a proof quarter. Now the quarter was worn there was obvious sites of wear because it had been in circulation, but because the reading was so very sharp, 
when I was, you know, holding it in my fingers, that's how I could tell. And, you know, um, I think my son was maybe 14 or 15 at the time. And that was probably the last time my son thought that I was an intelligent person since that time, <laughs> since that time, or like today, he, he wonders how I can find my way home at night. Oh, no. uh, so, but, but to answer your question, uh, it, there was obvious signs of wear, and I still have that quarter, by the way, there, there are obvious signs of wear, but it's still a proof coin because it, uh, the term proof describes how it was made. And you can never take that away from a proof. So you, could you have a proof coin in good condition? Absolutely. You don't see that very often. And, you know, that coin actually tells a story because since it was a proof coin, uh, somebody bought that from the mint for more than a, for more than 25 cents, right? There's a premium attached to proof coins because the mint has to go through special preparations to produce that coin. So that coin has a story, you know, someone broke into a proof set and decided that they were going to spend that coin, you know, and we'll never know who or why or how, but th that did happen. And that's why I love to talk about how coins can tell stories. And, and, and so that's the story behind that particular coin. So I, I hope I was able to answer your question in terms of how it can be uh, circulated, but yet still be a proof coin. So my internet cut out and a bunch of them seem to have disappeared. So if you have questions or again, that you have already entered, please enter them again because they disappeared off of mine. It looks like people are coming back. Okay. Uh, are grading standards different between U.S. coins, foreign coins, and ancient coins? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's another grading. Uh, that's another great question. Um, so here's the deal: uh, with ancient coins, uh, every ancient coin that, unless you're the one who actually dug it out of the ground, every ancient coin has been conserved, which is a nice way of saying it's been cleaned. And uh, if you send in a cleaned United States coin to a third-party grading company, that's obviously clean. It's going to come back as uh, clean. Uh, so there, there, uh, there's a difference in, in, in that idea between ancient coins and United States coins. When I'm teaching the grading class, we actually spend a small amount of time uh, where I bring in some world coins and we grade them based on the standards that we have um, uh, put together uh, that people, my, my students have learned for United States coins, because I really do believe, and in my discussions with Ken Brissett, uh, Ken believes this as well, that once you have a grounded idea of what a extra fine coin looks like, or a very good coin looks like, you can pretty much apply those standards to world coins as well as United States coins. Now, the only caveat to what I've just told you is early American copper coins. Early American copper coins, the folks who deal with those have a completely different grading system than the established grading system for uh, United States coins. So if you are a specialist in early American copper coins, you know that there is a different grading system that is employed by them that rather than uh, the standard grading system that we have. And the next one, oh, oh, okay, are almost all of the descriptions for grading focus on wear until MS, but how should you factor in other things like dings, scratches, discoloration, et cetera? Perfect question. And again, just like I said with Luster, um, it's not that I don't want to answer that because that's a wonderful question, but I am going to address that in the next segment. So I'm just going to hold off a little bit um, because we're going to move on to the next segment where we address things like that. And if after I've addressed it, you still are not clear, please feel free to ask that question again or, or you know, ask it in a different way and I'll do my very best to help. Okay? okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move on, Logan, to the next set. So when we discuss technical grading, we're talking about, um, actually, this is more science than art, because like I said, um, you can learn uh, what it is that um, worn to equal a specific grade. Um, 
And when we use technical grading standards, it's kind of understood that really there's no such thing as a perfect example. Um, and when we, again, when we're using technical grading, it's really circulated versus mint state coins. And, and I'm going to again say that uh, most people will employ technical grading standards, which is, is basically a measurement of wear with coins that are uh, extra fine all the way down. AU is kind of a gray area. Okay. And, and with uh, AU, you can use um, technical grading if it's a lower end AU and or market grading. Most, for examples of 58s uh, within the AU spectrum are market graded. Um, and certainly mint state coins generally are market grading. Okay. Uh, technical grading is often considered by purists as true grading of a coin. Market grading. So, and, and this will start helping with that last question. Um, market grading is, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, mint state coins, what we're looking at are four things. We're looking at marks, strike, luster, and eye appeal. And uh, again, I keep on uh, going to Bill Fieva, uh, but he said something that was very profound for me. And he said, marks, strike, and luster equal eye appeal. And you know, he's right. Um, and we're going to take a look at each of these in just a moment. But these are the four variables, mark, strike, luster, and eye appeal, that uh, are used for market grading. Okay. Um, can an AU coin still be graded MS? Yes, I've seen it, especially with uh, large denomination gold coins. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is that uh, their value, okay? So you might see a, uh, a coin that, uh, a double eagle, let's say a St. Gaudens double eagle that's a rare date, and it's an AU coin. And they say, uh, but, you know, the grading company says, look, you know, I've, I've seen this coin. Uh, it's going to bring this kind of money all day long. It's going to bring MS-62 money all day long. So it becomes an MS-62. Um, and there's also the idea of friction versus wear. Uh, friction versus wear can be very different. A long time ago, collectors kept coins in cabinets. And what that meant is that they actually rubbed when they were putting them in or taking them out. And so that can be an example of friction. Okay. Uh, large diameter coins are allowed more friction. Softer metal coins are allowed more friction. And that's important to, to know because when we're looking at coins, uh, coins are treated differently depending on their metal composition. So gold is the softest of the metals and it's also the most valuable. So therefore graders often allow a little bit more leeway with gold coins because they're so soft and because they can pick up nicks uh, and hits, especially the large gold coins, more easily than any others. Silver is a soft metal, but not as soft as gold. And so they don't give quite as much leeway with silver coins as they do with gold coins, but they do give more leeway with silver coins than opposed to copper because copper is a harder metal. And as you can surmise, copper coins generally, I'm speaking in general terms now, uh, general, generally copper coins tend not to be as uh, as pricey as silver and gold coins. And then the hardest of the four metals that the mint commonly uses uh, is nickel. And so nickel coins are generally graded very conservatively because a coin that, uh, a nickel that has a significant hit on it um, means that it was hit pretty good for it to show because nickel coins are so very hard, right? When you're examining a coin, there is a certain way that you want to go about doing that. And, and as I mentioned in here, consistency really is the key. You want to do the same, you want to examine a coin the same way, each of your coins the same way. And if you do that, you'll probably come up with a consistent grade, okay? You want to make sure that you wash your hands. Uh, no eating or drinking uh, and uh we often say you want to talk about your coins, not over them. 
So, you know, make sure that you're not eating or drinking and, uh, you know, don't hold a coin close to your mouth. You want to make sure that you're sitting comfortably. You want to use the best possible equipment that you can have available. And most importantly, most importantly, you need to know your series. Okay. So when people are, are uh, collecting a series, let's say that they're collecting Morgan dollars, it's extremely important to know all about Morgan dollars. In other words, you need to know um, which mints generally produced weak strikes, which mints produced strong strikes. Um, you can have an idea as to why certain Morgan dollars tone and others do not. Okay. And so you really need to know your series. And I can't stress that enough. Uh, you want to get as clear of, of you as possible, the coin. Uh, if you're at a show, only uh, make sure that you always ask the dealer before picking up a coin. Um, you drop it, generally you buy it. So hold the coin very carefully. Again, we talked about don't talk over a coin. Here's what I like to tell people about coins, you know, and this is, a, I know this is philosophical, but we never really own coins. I mean, yeah, I have coins in my collection and I worked hard and paid the money for them. I mean, in the, the world, I consider them my coins as, as you do with yours. But really, we never really own coins. We're only fortunate enough to take care of them for a little while. And what your job is as a coin collector is your job is to be able to uh, make sure that that coin stays in the condition that it is when it reached you, okay? That's your job um, as, as the caretaker of that coin. And I personally take that very seriously and, and I hope that you do as well. Type of lighting. When you're examining a coin, there are four basic different types of lighting. There's sunlight, fluorescent, halogen, and incandescent. Um, we teach in the grading class that the light source that you're probably that we suggest we recommend is incandescent. Okay, uh, a 60 or 70 watt bulb is the be best bulb. Uh, something that is 40 is kind of too dark, and 100 is too light. The reason that we don't like fluorescent uh, or halogen uh, is that uh, they tend to be too intense. And they tend to show up every possible flaw on a coin. And what's going to happen is you're going to become too critical um, with a particular coin. And that's not good. Sunlight is the worst of all. Um, you, you, you just don't want to use sunlight as the, the, your source for grading. Um, I, I, again, a real quick story. Um, it shows we have a uh, game for youngsters called Treasure Trivia where we give them a question slash answer sheet and then they go around and they ask predetermined dealers questions, numismatic questions. Then when they come back to us, uh, we are the last one that they come back to. And, um, you know, if we go over the answers and make sure their answers are correct. And then we give them some really nice prizes. Well, when we go to a show in a different state, we often try to coordinate the color of the question slash answer sheet with something that is famous in, uh, in that particular state. And uh, I can't, re uh, I, yeah, it was in Denver, okay? We uh, decided that we were gonna use orange because of the Denver Broncos, orange being one of their colors. And so the sheets, we used orange stationery. Well, if you took that sheet outside and looked at, at the sunlight, it didn't look orange at all. It looked goldenrod. And I mean, you would swear, you would swear that it was goldenrod. So if, uh, if sunlight can change the color of an object, imagine what it can do when you're trying to grade a coin. Now, unfortunately, at most uh, large coin shows, what is the primary light that is used in the hall? Fluorescent, okay? And so when you're attending a large show, particularly, what you're going to want to do is get into the habit of using an incandescent lamp to examine the coins. Now, fortunately, dealers are issued incandescent lamps to use at the coin show. And that's the reason. 
Uh, so please make sure that you avail yourself to those lamps when you are looking at a coin um, and you're strongly considering purchasing it, okay? Magnification. Um, we like to tell people that they are to use a power of either five or seven, no larger than that. Um, higher power loops are good for varieties if you're looking for something very small on a coin. But if you're just looking at a coin to be able to grade it, nothing more than a five or seven, because the higher the magnification, the uh, more distortion on a coin. And again, just like fluorescent lights, if you use too high of a loop on a coin, you're going to pick things out on a coin. It shouldn't necessarily be a factor. When I teach grading, uh, the teach the grading class, we tell people that the very first thing you're supposed to do is you're supposed to examine the coin by using your eyes. First, come up with a grade and then use the loop to deny or confirm your initial impression. And as you become better at grading, you're going to find that your initial impression, just using your eyes, is the correct impression. So only use the loop to um, deny or confirm your initial thought, your initial idea about what a particular coin grade is. I see so many people, as soon as they encounter a coin, go right to their loop. They shouldn't do that. They should look at the coin with their eyesight first and then move on to the loop. Um, if you have access to a padded velvet tray, that's always a good thing. If you don't have a padded velvet tray, uh, a towel will suffice. And again, that's to keep the coin in a soft environment. And, and again, you don't want to drop it. Always hold the coin by its edge if it's raw. You want to hold the coin 8 to 12 inches under the light source. Again, you're going to view the coin without magnification. Remember that there are three sides to a coin. There's the obverse, the reverse, and the edge. Uh, for many coins, there's a lettered edge, right? So that's an important part. You're going to look at the focal points. We're going to spend a, a time on what the focal points are in just a minute. And to look for luster uh, for AU and mint state coins, especially, you're going to rotate and rock the coin to, re to view the light reflection, because that's the only way you'll be able to determine the amount of luster on a coin is by moving it around so that the, li the light reflects it in different ways. Um, systematic review. A lot of people decide that they're going to review the field first, then the devices, then the rim and edge. Some people I've seen uh, mentally divide the, the coin up into quadrants. Uh, and then they look at each quadrant. Uh, I don't do that, but I don't, if, if you like doing that and you're comfortable with doing that, I, I wouldn't discourage that. Okay. So here are the parts of a coin. Uh, any part of the uh, coin that is unencumbered by device is called a field. So therefore you see what the field is. Um, devices. There are primary devices, and in this instance, Lady Liberty is the primary device. The stars are the secondary device. Uh, there are coins that have very complicated devices. So you could have a primary, a secondary, a tertiary device, and so on. And that's very possible. Okay. There is the rim on a coin. The rim on the coin serves two purposes. The rim is uh, there to protect uh, in, in theory, it's the highest point on the coin, and it's used to protect the devices that are in the central part of the coin. Think of it sort of as a fence. Um, and then um, the other reason rims exist is to uh, make coins stackable. And then there's the edge, okay, the third side to a coin. So market grading attributes, when we're looking at a coin, we're initially determining whether it's slightly cir circulated or mint state or mint state coin. We're looking at the number of marks on the surface, especially in the field and on the primary uh, device. We're examining the strike quality and fullness. Um, we're determining the amount of mint luster. And after we've done all of those things, 
then we will come up with the idea of does it have eye appeal, okay? Let's talk about surface marks first. So the first thing we, we need to be able to do is determine what type of mark it is. There are bag marks, there are roll marks, there are friction marks. Those happen at the source. In other words, those happen at the mint. And then there are owner inflicted marks, hairlines, album slide marks, flip marks. Um, location and severity of the marks are paramount. Let's take a look at focal points. So here's a uh, gold coin, $10 gold piece. It's an eagle. And um, what we need to do is by looking at the design on the coin, we need to decide where are the focal points? Well, what are focal points? Focal points are the areas that your eyes are naturally attracted to first. Generally, focal points are the highest points on a coin, generally. Therefore, focal points also show initial wear. So on this particular coin, the area of the focal points are on the obverse, it's Lady Liberty's cheek area, the date, and the field in front of her. Okay. And it's just, why would you say the field in front of her? Well, it's just with this particular coin, it's a larger coin. And when people are holding it between their thumb and, and forefinger, chances are that's exactly where the thumb is, right there. On the reverse, it's the denomination at the very bottom and the, uh, the center uh, uh, where that's, that's the other focal point. Let's see if you can figure out where the focal points for a two cent piece is. It's not that hard. There they are. So on the on the obverse, it's right where the horizontal lines are and the date. And on the reverse, it's the area where you'll find two cents right in the center of the coin. Often with designs, uh, the center of the coin happens to be the area of the highest relief. It's not always the case, but on most times it is. And if that's the case, highest relief, that's probably the area that gets attacked first in terms of wear. All right, let's look at surface marks. So if we look at this Morgan dollar, you can see that there are some marks in the field. Um, on Lady Liberty herself, there are some, but they're very light. And so this is a pretty nice coin uh, because it's, it's virtually almost mark free. Nice coin. All right, <clears throat> now let's look at this coin again. And you'll notice at the very bottom, at uh, seven o'clock, above the two stars, there's a pretty significant mark there. And that's a bag mark. How do I know that's a bag mark? Because, I, because the Morgan dollars have reeded edges. And what happened with this coin is, after it was ejected from the minting press, uh, it was very warm to the touch, meaning that the, the coin itself was soft because of the temperature, very malleable. And uh, one of the next coins that was ejected landed on this coin, uh, the edge hitting this coin and left the impression of the reeded edge there. And that's why, we, that's why we call it a bag mark. A lot of people think that bag marks are created by coins hitting each other once the coins have been bagged. And in most instances, that's not necessarily so. Uh, when you see a bag mark like this, this happened immediately after the coin was minted, before it was put in a bag. Um, however, even though that is a pretty obvious mark and it's fairly large, it's in an area that is not a focal point. So what I'm saying by that is when you look at this coin, you are initially, you initially may not even see that mark because it's in an area where it's, it's not, uh, near the center of the coin. And so therefore this particular mark would not count as a subtraction uh, by, uh, by a grader, as opposed to it being in a more obvious area. Let me show you what I mean. Here's the same coin, okay? Notice where the bag mark is now. 
all right? This is a focal area. I mean, your eyes just attra are attracted to that mark, sort of like a laser beam. So they're going to be less generous on the grade with this particular coin because the bag mark is in an a much more obvious area than the first example. All right, now you can see the bag mark on her chin. And again, this is another example where your eyes just hit, you know, focus on it right away. And so again, this is not a really good area for a mark to appear. Even though it's on the neck, this is not considered quite as bad as the two previous ones that I've shown you. It is more obvious than the first example, but not as obvious as the focal points that uh, the, the other two bag marks hit. So if we look at all four coins, okay, you would, uh, hopefully you would agree that the uh, lower right is the least invasive of the marks. And then we would go to the upper left where the mark is on the neck that is slightly more invasive than the first one, but less so than the other two. Uh, the one on the upper right where the bag mark is on her chin would be the next most severe. And, this, and the severity of the bag mark at the lower left, that's the one that is most troublesome, okay? So when we're looking at marks, we're not only looking at the length or depth, severity of the mark, but we're also looking for where it is located. Friction on gold. So here's an example of a St. Gaudian's, uh, St. Gaudian's $20 piece. And there's, it's a high relief. So there are very uh, high points on this coin that are going to attract wear if the coin is circulated. Where are the focal points? Well, there they are. On the obverse, it's the knee and the breast. And on the reverse, it's the breast of the eagle and the uh, area above the eagle where its wings are. Uh, we, I could also have included the tips of the wings, uh, and that would have been fine. Friction on silver. Again, we mentioned to you that um, friction, a certain amount of friction is allowed on uh, silver coins, not as much as gold, because gold is so very soft, but it, it is listed on silver coins. Here's an example where the focal areas uh, for a Morgan dollar are located. You can see the cheek, the area right in front of Lady Liberty, the hairline uh, on the reverse, the eagle's breast, and the uh, tip of the wing on the left-hand side. Those are the areas that generally show initial wear. Okay. Someone asked earlier about luster, and I deferred to that because I wanted to spend some time talking about it here, and then we'll probably open it up to a few more questions. Um, luster is extremely important, especially for mint state through AU grades. Um, sometimes, though, luster can even be present in coins that are graded very fine. Not very often, but it happens. Um, there are various luster types, and we're going to talk about that. And the luster types really depend on the, um, the dye preparation, the design of the coin, and it varies with dye use. Here's the most important. How is luster created? Luster is created through metal flow at the mint. Let me show you what I mean. Um, there are, different types of, there are different types of luster, and it really depends on the wear of the dyes. So when you have two brand new dyes, they're going to create coins that are called proof-like. And I don't like using that term. I understand what it means, but I just don't like it because, once again, we're using a proof term in a, in a way to describe sort of grades, and, and I don't like to do that. But I, but I know what they're trying to say here. And what they're trying to say is with a proof-like coin, it's a business strike coin. It's not a proof coin, but there's a tremendous amount of mirror reflectivity because the dyes are so very new. After the dyes have a chance to wear a little bit, then we will get into what is called semi-proof-like. 
Um, and then we'll get into Frosty, where there are notable flow lines, uh, but you still see a, a, a cartwheel effect. Then the coin gets into a satin type of luster, which um, there's very little metal flow and the luster is subdued. And then finally, when a, a pair of dyes are so worn that it, there's hardly any luster created at all. And so when you have a coin that is mint state, but it has very little luster, that probably means that the dyes were very worn when that particular coin was created. So, <clears throat> when a planchet is in the coining chamber and the dyes are hitting the planchet, they're hitting it with such force that metal flows out from the center of the planchet, okay? And this happens instantaneously. And after that happens, when the dyes are beginning to release and move away uh, and the pressure is reduced, the metal flows back. So that metal flow initially out and then back in is what creates luster, okay? And here's what you need to know. Here's another one uh, that I want you to walk away with. Luster can only be created at the mint. It can never be recreated. So once luster is lost, it can never come back again. There is a difference between luster and shininess, okay? Often clean coins are shiny. They're not lustrous. Coins that are, came out from the mint and are mint state and happen to um, be a, a coin that was minted early along in the life of a die, they tend to be very lustrous. And that is because of the metal flow. So once again, luster is created by metal flow. And once it is lost, it can never, ever be recreated. Okay. Um, quick story. And then we'll open it up. I um, had a friend uh, who was teaching a grading class with me. And this particular class was having a very difficult time learning the difference between luster and shininess. So he happened to have a roll of 1964 quarters. And we found a bowl and he had some um, cleaner. And he took one of the mint state 64 quarters and he dipped it in the solvent several times, hoping to remove the luster and show shininess. And he just couldn't get, it was right before lunch and he couldn't get the effect that he was looking for. So he said, okay, I'm going to leave the quarter in the bowl in the cleaner. And when we come back from lunch, I'll pull it out and everyone will get to see the difference then between a coin that is lustrous and a coin that is shiny. Um, because what happens is that solvents that are used to clean coins actually destroy luster over time. Okay. And uh, I did a, a very naughty thing. Uh, right across the road where our office was, I happened to have a dime it was a barber dime that was so worn, it was just really a sliver of itself. So I went and got it and I came back to the classroom and I took the quarter out and I put that sliver of a dime into the bowl. And um, when the instructor came back, uh, he walked into the room and sure enough, he happened to be the last person to come into the room and everybody was aware of what I did. And he said, okay, I'm going to pull that quarter out. And he looked over into the bowl and he saw this sliver of a dime and his eyes got as big as moon pies. And uh, so uh, that's, that's my story about what uh, leaving a coin in uh, solvent uh, can do. If it, it will attack luster. Now, people often will dip a coin because it'll remove impurities and it can do that. And for a time, it can look actually better than what it did before, okay? But if you dip a coin too many times, you're gonna create this washed out appearance and, and uh, 
that's that's what happens. So you want to be very careful if you decide that you want to dip a coin because, um, and I'm going to tell you, most Morgan dollars, most Morgan dollars have been cleaned at one, at one time or another. There are very few Morgan dollars that are in their original skin. Very few. This is what luster looks like. We've taken a scent here and we have um, magnified it greatly. And uh, you can see that there are peaks and valleys. And the reflection off of the peaks and valleys is what luster is. And it's created by that metal flow that we were talking about. And every time you clean a coin or every time that coin is circulated, those peaks are going to wear. And so as the peaks wear, that causes the, the, the coin to lose luster. And it'll get to the point where the peaks are virtually gone, that the coin is flat. And then at that point, it has no luster or it has that washed out appearance. All right, Logan, if you're with us, we'll, we'll open it up for coins for the second round. Yeah, so I have a couple that emailed me their questions from before. So we'll get to those first. How do you view the role of CAC? Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of people who use, uh, CAC and, um, uh, I, I certainly a coin that has a, uh, CAC sticker on it tends to be extremely liquid. It, it, it tends to help the, uh, asking price of that particular coin. So in that sense, uh, I, I can see its value personally, and, and this is only personally, this is not. This is not the uh, view of the ANA uh, in any sense. I'm, I'm talking as Rod Gillis, not as an ANA spokesman. Um, personally, I, I think that when you send a coin into one of the third party grading companies that you're paying them to come up with a grade. And I'm not sure about another company verifying what the original company did. Uh, but but that's that, again, that's just me. I, I'm not here to criticize CAC. That's not my purpose in life. Um, I, I'm not sure that I would ever, I'm not sure I even own a coin that would be qualified to send a CAC, but, but if I did, um, I'm not sure that I would do that again. I understand why people do. It tends to make a coin uh, more liquid and more valuable amongst collectors. Um, but it's not something that I personally take advantage of. And the next one, I don't understand the notion of market grading. It seems like grading should be technical grading and market grading should be called an appraisal. It seems like it's deceptive. Can you explain why the coin market finds this amb ambiguity useful? Market grading must be useful or wouldn't be used. Well, no, sure. Um, and again, please understand, I, I'm not, my purpose is not to try to talk down um, people who employ market grading or the third party grading companies. That, that's not my, my purpose. But I, I think it's important to understand that um, when we're looking at mint state coins, okay, because mint state means that there's no wear, we've got to, if we're going to use 60 through all the way up through 70, we have to have determiners that um, will, uh, so that we can qualify a coin um, that, that, that doesn't show wear. And so market grading is used primarily for mint state and AU coins to um, use the four determiners that we talked about, uh, strength of strike, mark, uh, the amount of luster, and eye appeal. Those are the determiners in market grading. Now, there are some purists who very much, you know, they don't even like to use the difference, uh, the difference in MS coins. Um, they like to say, you know, a coin is uh, mid state, uh, or they have, you know, determiners that would be higher for that. Uh, and that's okay. Um, you know, there's room enough for all, but you know, it's, I, I just think it's important to understand that when you're looking at a mint state coin, that, um, part of the equation that the third party grading companies make is the, uh, in their experience, the value of that particular coin. And, and like I said, I have seen coins that uh, in our museum that over the course of time have gone from XF to AU to mid state. 
And like I said earlier in our in, in my presentation, grades do change. So maybe it can be an argument for, you know, well, the grading has changed. And uh, here's how we came up with that particular grade. Uh, that's but but there's no denying I, I, I get what you're saying. And there's no denying that saying that there are purists out there who only employ technical grading. Uh, I know some very famous people who do not have coins that are slabbed in their collection. Their collection is entirely of, uh, made up of raw coins. And so if, if you're in that category, then more than likely you're going to employ technical grading for all the coins that you have. Um, there's, I, I, don't want to, I don't want people to think about it as good and bad or right or wrong. It's like there's enough room there for everybody. What's important is that you need to be comfortable with the, uh, with the grading methods and terms that you employ because they're your coins. And so, uh, you, you know, that, that's what I mean by all of us have enough talent to be able to grade our own coins. And I think as long as you are educated in the ways of grading, uh, and you can find your area of um, comfort uh, in grading, and, and that should be just fine. All right. Uh, we have a lot of questions about LED lights. Yeah. Oh. And how uh, it's there some that what about LED lights? I haven't used an incandescent in forever. Um, how does LED fall on this scale? And yeah. then another one for foot viewing and photographing coins with an LED light. Yeah. I, well, let me start off by I'm not I'm not an expert on photographing uh, coins. We have someone on staff here. His name is Rob Kelly, and Rob is is. Uh, is an expert in, in photographing coins. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I haven't seen anyone uh, grade, uh, I'm sorry, photograph coins. So as Rob does, um, if, if you have a specific question uh, uh, concerning uh, photographing coins, uh, I suggest that you contact Rob. He can be at kelly at money.org. It's K-E-L-L-E-Y. There's a second E. Kelly at uh, money.org. And, um, but Rob is, is, is an expert much more so than I. So I don't feel qualified in answering the photographic questions. I'm sorry. What was the first one part about? Um, I think it was just, oh, they haven't bought the, an incandescent. The inc yeah. The, so um, again, um, with any other type of incandescent uh, rather than incandescent, um, I, I just think that it, the light is too intense. It shows flaws on a coin. You know, when we start out grading coins, all of us, I'm not just all of us, I think that there's a natural reaction for us to be very afraid of not catching something on the coin. You know, none of us want to hear, what do you mean it's a mint state coin? Can't you see this? It's obviously a very fine coin. We're all afraid of that. Yeah. You know? and, 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 and I understand that, okay? So the natural reaction for us when we begin learning how to grade is we tend to be too strict and using very bright lights encourages that. And so we don't want to do that. What I tell people is at the very beginning of our class, what you need to learn is you need to learn about what's right about a coin before you seek what's wrong about it. And I just think, and, and you know, the people that I teach with all agree that incandescent lighting supports that. And, and, and that's what, what, what you're, that I, I, I truly believe that that's the best way. That's the best lighting source is, is incandescent. And, you know, I can't be the only one to say that or to agree with that, because like I said, if you go to a coin show, you're going to see more than likely every dealer have access to a lamp that has an incandescent bulb in it. I know at our coin shows they do, and they're there for a reason. It's not because it's dark. Um, they're there because that's the best lighting source to use when you're seriously examining a coin. We'll take one more. Okay, uh, what is a flip mark? What is a what mark? Flip mark. Um, I'm assuming that a flip mark is very much like the mark that happens with um, some uh, albums. Um, plastic, uh, uh, plastic flips 
and the albums where you can see both sides of the coin and they use that plastic to kind of, you know, if you, if you aren't very careful, that can actually rub up or even scratch a coin. Um, and, you know, with flips, uh, there are uh, coin, uh, there are flips that have PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and there are flips that do not. And the, the flips that do not have polyvinyl chloride um, are flips that are, are not very pliant at all. And I can see how easily they could uh, mark up a coin. Uh, polyvinyl chloride flips uh, are okay because they, they are more pliant uh, as long as you don't keep coins in there for an extended period of time. So in other words, if you have a polyvinyl PVC uh, uh, flip, a flip that has polyvinyl chloride in it, you put a coin in there, polyvinyl chloride is not going to attack the coin the next day. That's not how it works. It, it, it would take several months to do that. So my answer to that is um, when you're using flips, um, polyvinyl chloride flips are not necessarily a no-no if it's a very temporary form of holding on to the coin. If you're planning on uh, holding uh, onto the coin and using it for long term, then you definitely don't want to use a, a PVC flip. How can you tell PVC flips? Well, once again, they're very soft to the touch, and many of them have a blue tint to them. Um, dealers use polyvinyl chloride uh, flips because they know in theory that their coins are not going to be uh, held for long periods of time in those flips. So it's, it's okay. Um, but you don't want to keep uh, a coin in a, in a uh, polyvinyl chloride flip for years on end, especially a copper coin because you'll, what you'll notice is this green goo on, that's actually attacking the coin that's very difficult to get off. It's, it's actually eating at the coin. And, um, and that's not something that you want. Okay. Oh, we'll take one more. Okay. Let me open it back up. Um, <clears throat> uh, still wondering about luster on AU coins. According to the ANA standards, an AU coin needs to have a certain percentage of its luster. But yeah. I've seen graded AU coins with very little luster. Is this yeah. on account of market grading? Okay, so uh, let's let's attack that question. So um, an AU fifty eight coin, okay, an AU fifty eight coin is really think of it as a mid state coin with just a slight amount of wear. Um, um, an, an AU coin, an AU fifty eight would equate to a 63 or 64 mint state coin luster wise, except that it has a little wear. Now, as you go down the AU chain, there you're, you're, you're losing luster. So a 55 um, may have the same amount of wear as the 58, but it just doesn't have the luster that the 58 does. Now with the 50, uh, 53, it's the, the wear is more noticeable and so is the luster. And when you're at 50, um, there's very little luster left. But when you're talking about an AU58 coin, it is, it is lustrous, okay? Um, it just has a little bit of wear. Uh, there's an argument to be made that an AU58 coin has more eye appeal than a 60, 61, or 62 MS coin. Because for an MS coin to be a 60 or a 61, especially, that means it's a problem coin. Now, I don't mean it's a problem coin because it's been cleaned or something like that. That's not what I'm saying. Um, a, an MS 60 coin should look like it's been sitting in the back of a gravel truck for a very long time. It's got marks on it that are just not good. It has very little luster. It's, it's not an attractive coin. It has very little eye appeal. Whereas an AU58 has a ton of eye appeal, there, it just has a little bit of wear. Now that MS60 or 61, by definition, has no wear whatsoever, but uh, it's been hit by the ugly stick. You know, UGLY ain't no alibi. It's an ugly stick. <laughs> and the problem is, the problem is that if you have an MS60 or 61 coin, they're very hard to sell. They're very hard to sell, as opposed to an AU58. If you can get past that, you know, the coin, uh, you know, there are some people where the coin must not have anywhere on it at all before I'll consider it. And if you're one of those people, well, that's fine. 
you know, that's how you want to collect. But if you can get past that, okay, and if a, 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 just an infinitesimal amount of wear is on the coin, but that's it. Uh, you know, it doesn't have any marks in focal point areas. It's, it's got a ton of eye appeal. Um, and AU58 is the coin for you. Not only because it has more eye appeal than a 60 or 61, but for, oftentimes you can get it for less money than a mint state coin. Okay, so I, I, you know, I have a lot of, as you can probably guess, I have a lot of 58s in my collection and I have no problem with that at all because they have a ton of eye appeal. And I'd much rather have, for the reasons that I've stated, I'd much rather have a 58 than I would a 60 or 61. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay, so here's a mid-state coin and it looks like wear, but it's suffering from dye erosion. Uh, actually, there's a couple things going on with this coin. So this coin has um, uh, very, worn. this was very worn dyes. Okay, and there are a couple reasons. And there's also a clash. This coin has clashed. So that's why I wanted to show you this picture. How can you tell the dye erosion? Well, if you look at the left-hand uh, image, see the points of the stars that are just elongated, moving towards the rim? That is a characteristic of a very worn dye. On the right-hand side, look at the date, how it's encroaching upon the rim. That's not where, that's a worn dye, okay? But you can also see above the eight and above the one, see the U, the inverted U and I? That's because what happened is that at one point, the dies creating this coin hit each other because there wasn't a planchet that was in between the two dies. And when that happens, the dies pick up a portion of the design from each other. And from that point on, that will be reflected in all the coins. We get a ton of people all the time who, who call us and they say they have a coin that shows a clash. And the mistake is they think that this is a one-time event and it's not. For, for After that happens one time, after the dies are, have clashed, from that point on, as long as the dies are used, uh, that, that clash will be reflected on the coin, all right? Um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, why did they use the, uh, such a worn die? Well, because the mint is a factory, okay? It's not like Disneyland where magical things happen. It's a factory and they're trying to produce a product that is consistent, but as inexpensively as possible. Now, back in 1813, they didn't have the quality control that they do today. And the mint is very good about number one, keeping the number of errors to a minimum. And number two, producing a consistent product. Not so much back in 1813, but dyes were hard. They were hard to manufacture. They were hard to come by. And so the mint used dyes as, as long as they could um, until virtually they fell apart before they put new dyes because every time you use a new set of dyes, you're encouraging expense. If you look at Lincoln cents from the late 1920s, uh, there are certain Lincoln cents that you would swear you would swear that they are coins that are like VF coins, very fine coins. And actually they're mid state, but they have been, the dyes were just so worn because that during that time period, they did, they used dyes until you just couldn't use them anymore. They fell apart. Um, and so that's what we mean by dye erosion. Okay. So here's an example of what a proof like Morgan dollar uh, would look like. And, you know, uh, you can see hopefully the reflectivity in the field, especially on the obverse and the right hand side. So, what this is showing us is this is showing us a coin that was minted very, very young in the dye process. Okay. Here's a frosty luster. So, the dye is beginning to wear a little bit. It, it has no effect yet on the uh, devices, uh, but just in terms of the luster, you're getting, a, it's a, still a very lustrous coin, but you can sort of see on the obverse, the cartwheel effect, but it's not that proof-like reflectivity that we saw uh, initially. Here's a coin with satin luster. Satin luster, you're generally going to find on coins that are very low relief. 
The peace dollars are not nearly in as high relief as the Morgan dollars were. Hence, the, 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 sat, the luster is more of a satiny finish. It's not inferior. It's just the mechanics of making coins. Uh, so this is a, an example of what a Saturn luster, satin luster coin would look like. Now, again, not necessarily in this instance were the dyes worn. Um, the satin luster is very characteristic of low relief coins like the peace dollar. Okay. All right. So we've talked about um, luster and we've talked a little bit about um, the marks on a coin. Let's talk a little bit about strike quality. Uh, strike quality is important for mid-state through AU grades. Really, strike quality doesn't affect technical grading because it happened at the mint. So if you're encountering a coin that is uh, circulated and it's a weak strike, you don't hold that against the coin. Okay. Um, factors affecting strike quality. Striking pressure, the amount of spacing between the dies. You know, if, if the dies are set too far apart, so that they do not um, leave sufficient press pressure on the, on the blank, then that means that it, it's not going to uh, strike up as strong. Uh, if the dies are not parallel, if, if one of the dies is at a slight angle, then the lower part will hit very strong on that coin. And the part that is not parallel, the space further apart, it will look like a weak strike. And, uh, as we've discussed, worn or eroded dies. So here's a coin that is weakly struck. Um, this is an 1893 uh, Carson City coin. And how can we tell it's weakly struck? Well, if you look at the obverse of the ear and the hair above the ear, it's really not well defined. This is not where. This is a weakly struck coin. Okay. How do we? How can you tell the difference between a weakly struck coin and where? It's an excellent question. And when you're just learning how to grade, that's probably the toughest thing that you're going to run across. Okay, but there are a couple of things that you can help yourself with. Number one, know your series. Know what coins tend to be weakly struck and from what mints. Okay, know where uh, coins that are weakly struck, where the weakly struck part of the design will show up. So in Morgan dollars, it's the year and the hair above the ear on the obverse. On the reverse, it's the eagle's breast. Okay, so you can see on that one that it's not particularly well-defined. And that's why this coin is weakly struck and not worn. To someone who is not used to looking for this, they would look at that hair and they would look at that ear and say, oh, you know, that's within the focal point. It's right in the center of the coin. That's where, well, it's not. And the other thing that, deter that uh, you can spot where from weakly strike is that uh, coins that wear, that are circulated, the wear is also a change in color, okay? So with a weakly struck coin, it's not a change in color, but there is if the coin is worn. Okay, and these are the areas that I was just referring to. Here's a weakly struck uh, buffalo nickel. You look on the obverse, um, you can see that there's an area where the uh, Native American's hair is that's just sort of a, like a blob. There's not much definition at all. And on the reverse, uh, on the bisons uh, up, up at the top, there's not a lot of definition either. Uh, um, there are a lot of weak strike nickel coins because the dyes tend to wear out faster because nickel is such a hard metal. Here's an example of a well-struck uh, buffalo nickel. Look at the design there above that, as opposed to, and I'll go back. Okay, look, look here. And then look here. You can see the difference. So there are certain coins that we know are called full strike coins. And I have five examples. Full split bands on the reverse of Mercury Dimes. Full bell lines on Franklin halves. Full head on the standing Liberty Quarters. Full steps on Jefferson Nichols. And a full, to full torch on Roosevelt Dimes. These coins, by definition, are fully well-struck coins. 
you're not going to have a weekly struck coin that will be able to show you the uh, what, what I'm going to show you now. Okay. So here are full bands on a uh, um, Liberty Head nickel. Okay. On the reverse. Notice in the center, the bands on the Fosse's, they are split because, and what we tell people is imagine that this is a, uh, a river and you have a boat and your job is to sail from one edge of the coin or one edge of the Fosse's to the other. If there are any impediments along the way that you, that would block you from sailing, like sort of like the Suez Canal, um, then uh, that's not a split bands, okay? In this particular instance, because of the photography, it's a little hard to see, but this is an example of uh, split bands, okay? You could sail a, a boat from one edge to the other, and there's nothing blocking your way. Now, people often ask, well, so what if the center <coughs> has split bands, but the, the lower ones here or the top ones are not? I can guarantee you that because this is the center of the coin where it's the highest relief, where the metal has the furthest to flow, all right, if these bands are split, the other ones will be as well, okay? Full bell lines. There was a time not long ago when you needed to have this area of the bell lines full and straight across, as well as this area. Now, PCGS, and I just looked on their website just this afternoon, uh, PCGS says that right now they're only concerned with these. They're not concerned with these. So if you have a coin, if you send a Franklin half to PCGS and it comes back as full bell lines, what they've looked at is they've looked at the lines that are at the bottom, they have not looked at the lines that are up at the top. But like I said, there was a time when you had to have both for it to be considered full bell lines. That's an example of how grading has changed. Full head, standing liberty uh, quarters. For a standing liberty quarter to, have to be uh, considered full head, the bonnet here must be fully visible. The hairline must be fully visible. And right in the ear, there needs to be an ear hole. And if the ear hole is not there, or it's not a full um, hairline or bonnet, any of those things, it is not considered a full strike. Please don't misunderstand. That doesn't, full strike does not equate with uh, coins that are not mint state. If it doesn't have those things, that doesn't mean there's wear there. That just means it was not fully struck. And so you could have a mint state standing Liberty quarter that does not have an ear hole. Okay. It's just those that are fully struck are sold at a premium because most of the mint state uh, standing Liberty quarters do not have those features. Okay. So here are the full steps on the uh, Jefferson nickel. So for a coin to be considered fully, a Jefferson nickel to be fully struck, it, the um, columns need to be fully separated from the steps and the steps need to be fully separated from each other. They no longer exist, but at one time there was a Jefferson full step nickel club. Tell me they don't have too much time on their hands. Um, but there were. And so um, fully struck Jefferson Nichols, uh, the steps are separated and they are prized by Jefferson Nickel collectors. And then the last one, the full torch, you know, the, the bands and the Fosse's are all there struck. That's on Roosevelt Dimes. People don't talk about full torches with Roosevelt Dimes that much. I appeal. Okay, so we're in the final part. Um, it's the most variable attribute. Really, I appeal is individual opinion. Uh, but again, you need to understand that I appeal is made by, uh, number one, the marks or lack of marks, the strength of strike, and the amount of luster. 
Uh, eye appeal is also often subject to market trends. So here's an example. Here's a 20 cent piece, a double dime from 1875. Okay, let's take a look at this coin. Obviously, this coin has luster to it and toning. Now, there are some people who really like toning. There are some people who like toning, but only if it's very faint. And there are some people who like their coins blazing white, and they don't like toning at all. And you know what? None of those people are wrong, because that's the beauty of collecting coins. You collect what it is that you like, okay? Um, but there's obvious toning on this coin. Now, uh, this coin was auctioned off. And at the time that this coin was auctioned off, the market pricing trends for this coin was an AU example of this coin sold for $600. An MS60 sold for $1,000. And an MS63 sold $1,800. Okay. For this particular, for an example of this coin. Okay. Not this coin, but an example of this coin. So the question is, at the time this coin was auctioned off, what was the auction price realized? And the answer is $3,000. So what does that tell me? That tells me that there were at least two people in the auction who really liked toning, okay? Because if you didn't like toning, you probably wouldn't, weren't interested in bidding on this coin. And if you do like toning, you are probably very interested in purchasing this coin. So that's, that is an example of what I appeal is. Initial points of wear. Generally, it's the highest point of the coin. Um, you, when you see wear, you will see a color change, and that's because luster is being disturbed. The design will flatten. Um, the, the hardest thing as a new grader that is, is by far is learning the difference between wear and weak strike. And again, the, the thing is to know focal points, to know your series, and to look for a change of color and look at a lot of coins. That's the way that you'll eventually uh, gain a confidence to tell the difference between weak strike and wear. Tony, people often ask me, once a coin has been slabbed, does can it tone with inside a slab? Okay. So here's a coin. This is actually in my collection. Here's a Morgan dollar, 1878S. And it was listed by the company that graded this coin as MS63. But more importantly, look at the label. It says 100% white. So what that tells me is that at the time that this coin was actually put into a holder, it was blazing white. Well, if you can see the image, it doesn't quite look blazing white now. There are significant bits of toning, uh, especially on the obverse of the coin. So the question is, once it was put in and began to tone, will it continue to tone as years go by? So th these two images were taken about 10 years ago. On the left, you can see an image that was taken five years ago. And then on the right-hand side, you can take an image of the coin that was taken about a year ago. And look at the change in the toning. So can toning uh, occur inside of a slab? You bet. You bet. Okay. So uh, here's an example of an 1899 CC dollar AU. There is uh, some wear right here. It's a change in color. This is not because of a weak strike. There's a little bit of wear here. There's loss of luster right here, okay? And loss of luster right, loss of luster right here. However, notice that this coin, the, there are no marks on this coin. It's a really nice coin. There are just no marks on it. Um, this, is a, this is an example of a coin you would want to own, right? If you're not so hung up on mint state, because this, is, this, this has a ton of eye appeal. There's a lot going for this coin. It's a, it's a nice coin.
Okay. So here are the points that I showed you. You can see where there is a little bit of a loss of luster. Uh, and there's wear at the high point, both on the eagle's breast and above uh, Lady Liberty's ear. But again, there are very there are next to no marks on this coin. Nothing severe. Nothing wrong with the focal points. This is a this is a great coin. Okay, here's an example of a um, coin uh, buffalo nickel that has just a very slight amount of wear. Uh, where do I look for wear on buffalo nickels? Because if you don't know what you're looking for, it's, it would be easy to say this coin is probably mid state. On the obverse, I look here for a change in color. Okay. And on the reverse, I look right here. Now, Bill Fiva, who is a grading, uh, Buffalo nickel grading expert. I mean, if, if you held a gun to my head and said, you need to grade this Buffalo nickel correctly, or we're going to kill you. Uh, Bill Fiva would be the guy that I would say, Bill, you need to do this because Bill is the man in grading coins. And he is the one who came up with the idea of something called the Mesa effect. And what Bill does is he grades the reverse of Buffalo nickels before he looks at the obverse. And he looks right here for the Mesa effect. And what we're saying here is if there is rub here, this dividing line will go away. And, um, sort of it'll be flat like a mesa and and that's why he calls it the mesa effect okay this area right here this area right here are the ones that i look for okay there are other areas as well and i'm not saying that you don't you shouldn't look for these areas but this area and this area are the areas that i'm most comfortable with you want to be careful with uh, buffalo nickels about the horn because, again, grades do change. And at one time, you needed to have a full horn for it to be mint state. It's not that way anymore. You could have a weakly struck uh, buffalo nickel that does not show a full horn, and it could be mint state. Okay, here's an example of a $20 classic head. And where are where do we search for wear on this one? Well, in the obverse, I look for the change of color right here. And on the reverse, we can look here and here. See what I mean by right here? And see what I mean by right here? That's the areas that I look for. Some are more comfortable looking for here, and that's fine. But that's, I find the most success by looking here for me. Where do we look for wear on um, walking Liberty half dollars? Right here on the reverse. We look for wear right here. And on the obverse, we look for wear right here and right here. Now, Again, this is knowing your series. Walking Liberty half dollars are traditional for being weakly struck. And I've seen Walking Liberty half dollars that were struck during the Second World War where this is just a blob. There is no definition whatsoever of her hand. And it is mid-state. It's just weakly struck. So again, I'm looking for a change of color. Um, this is another area where you can often see where a change of color within the field. And that's simply because how people hold the coin when they were circulating. We've talked about this earlier. St. Gaudens, we're looking right here. We're looking right here. We're looking right here. We're looking right here. And maybe here. And again, this is all by knowing your series. It'll become second nature. Um, knowing Again, knowing your grade is uh, particularly important. Um, coins generally wear the, in the same way. So once you're uh, familiar with how coins wear in your particular series, you shouldn't have any trouble identifying it. Okay. So um, we're going to see a progression here. 
So here is a uh, mid-state uh, Morgan dollar. It's very highly graded. There, you have a couple little nicks here, but nothing here. Nothing here. F full strike, beautiful coin, highly graded. Okay. Uh, still mid-state, but there are a little few issues. A little bit of stuff here in the field. Just a little bit, not much, um, not quite as lustrous as the previous one, uh, hence a lower grade. Still a very pleasing coin, mint state, very nice coin. All right, remember we talked about the ugly stick? Okay, look what's all going on here. Look at what's going on here. Look here. Okay, these are all marks in the field. And they're just not attractive. Okay. Now you see where we're talking about 60s. Look at this here. Here. This is, an, this is a mint state coin, but it is very undesirable. You'd have a tough time selling this coin unless it was a rare coin. You know, unless it was a rare Morgan dollar. But if it's just a common date Morgan dollar, you're going to have a tough time selling this coin because it just has no eye appeal. It's completely mid-state, has nowhere at all, but it just has, it's just not a, an attractive coin. AU example, if you're beginning to see a little bit of discoloration, a little change in wear. Here's the discoloration here, here, on the Eagle's Breast a little bit, here, here. Very pleasing coin, a 55, has lost a little bit of luster, has a little bit of wear, but I would tell you again, that I'd much rather have this coin in terms of eye appeal than this coin. Okay, here we go into the extra uh, X fine. Uh, XF, you can see there's wear, obvious wear, obvious loss of luster, almost flat here in the eagle's breast. But again, this is a this is a nice coin because it's problem free. It's just honest to goodness wear. Most of the design is still there. There's it's not a problem coin whatsoever. It's a nice coin. It just has some wear. That's all. Very fine. No luster at all. Obvious wear, focal points. Again, not and this is an 1889 CC. There are very few of us who wouldn't want this coin. Uh, but again, it's uh, it does have wear, but it's an honest coin. Okay, now you can see where the design is really flattening out now. A VG. Now you can see where it's starting to encroach upon the rims. And this is a good. The design is in many places is completely gone. Okay. Um, next step for you. Learning never stops. I That's one of the reasons I love coin collecting because I'm learning all the time. And uh, that's great. Uh, you want to take, if you can, take advantage of taking a live grading class. Um, you'll want to take, and you work up the way, you want to take a live grading class that is um, fundamentals. Um, I'd love to be able to work with you. Uh, then there is a um, intermediate grading class through the ANA, and then there's even an advanced class. Uh, another class that I suggest that you take, if you can take it live, maybe at summer seminar, is the modern minting process. I firmly believe that you uh, have a much better understanding of how to grade coins if you are fully up to how coins are made. Um, Find new classrooms, coin shops, talking with coin dealers. Uh, very, there are some very nice coin dealers who will love to be able to talk with you about things. Uh, coin shows are a wonderful way. Uh, and make sure that you quiz yourself often in grading coins. Uh, that's the only way to be able to learn and be able to be proficient at it. Okay. Um, I, a minute or two, if you have any questions for me, I'll answer them and, and then I'll thank you for being here. Okay, we have a few that we can get to, I think. What device level is the date and mint mark considered? Um, depending on the coin, 
I would say most often they would, uh, the mint mark is really not considered a device, um, but the date, yes. And usually that's a secondary device. Okay. Uh, is rainbow toning natural? Um, you know, we don't know. We're, we're not absolutely 100% sure about what causes toning. Um, we believe that it's part of uh, the impurities found within uh, uh that are employed for certain coins. Uh, it also could have to do with how the coins are struck. And I say that because there are certain coins that are toned more readily than others. And there are certain toy, uh, toys, there are certain coins that tone more quickly than others. And the example that I always use is uh, the Colombian commemorative half dollars. Um, the Colombian commemorative half dollars tone very quickly and they tone black very quickly. Um, and uh, they, they just do. You'll see so many black Colombian half dollars. And we suspect that it was a mixture of the way that the coins were actually minted and the, the strain of silver that was used uh, for making the coins. Know this about toning. Uh, and and I, I actually like toning. Um, but toning is a corrosion. And uh, while uh, toning can be very beautiful, eventually all toned coins will tone black. Now, will it tone black while it's in your possession? Probably not, but it can. But at some point, the end game is with all toned coins at somewhere along the line, they will tone black because it is a, a corrosive effect. Again, if you buy a tone coin because you like how it looks, um, you know, there's a good chance that it won't tone anymore or, or just very slightly in your lifetime, and that's fine. But you saw the example that I showed you of that Morgan dollar that was in the holder. You saw the progression over 10 years. So it can happen. So I just want to bring that up. I'm not anti-tone. I'm not anti-blazing white. I'm just saying that uh, eventually all tone coins like they do with the Colombian uh, commemorative half dollars, all tone coins will tone black. Okay. Okay. I think that that is all we have time for. We're a little over. Oh, okay. Four, but if you I'm have sorry. any questions, you know, no, you're fine. Uh, if you have any questions that we didn't get to, you can either send them to me at lcurtis at money.org and I'll get them to Rod, or you can send them straight to Rod at gillis at money.org. Um, and we'll make sure to get those answers or those questions answered for you. Thank you all for joining us today. I want to hope you join us in the future. And thank you, Rod, for a very educational and well put together presentation, as always. Thank you, Rod. And, and we'll we have a lot of more a lot more presentations coming up from Rod next month. So we hope you all join us for those. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us.